Jack Smith is illegal. His appointment is invalid. That's according to a former attorney general, the leader of the Justice Department under Ronald Reagan. His name is Edwin Meese, and he has submitted an amicus brief along with some other law professors up to the Supreme Court of the United States. And what he is saying is that Jack Smith is not validly appointed to investigate this. Okay, Merrick Garland used the wrong statutes under the appointment clause, and he tried to rig this thing, as they usually do. And it's invalid, saying that the entire prosecution needs to be dismissed. We're going to get reaction to this and other conversations from Caitlin Collins on CNN. They're saying the courts are going to determine the fate here and that maybe this is not going to go in their favor. And Jen Psaki's freaked, man. What can we do? I don't know, Jen. Maybe you should indict him again. Good move. So let's take a look at the filing. This is what it looks like. And let's get our big, beautiful red pen out and ready to go. In the Supreme Court of the United States, the case is United States versus Donald Trump submitted by former Reagan Attorney General Edwin Meese, he says, guess what? We say that Jack Smith is illegal. This is an amici, so it's a brief from some law professors called Stephen G. Galabresi, Gary Lawson, supporting neither party, just saying, hey, SCOTUS, by the way, Jack Smith is invalid. Here's the question. Dear Supreme Court, from the former Attorney General under Reagan, smart guy, question, whether private citizen Jack Smith lacks authority to represent the United States, which jurisdictional requirement must exist at all stages of litigation and which cannot be waived in filing his petition for a writ of certiorari with the court. So can a private citizen, Jack Smith, who doesn't have any authority to be on this case, can he submit a brief just out of nowhere? Like an illegally appointed prosecutor is basically what this is asking. Can an illegally appointed prosecutor just file a brief about Trump to the Supreme Court? They're going to say no. And here's what they say to the court, arguing that Jack Smith has been illegally appointed, they say, guess what, SCOTUS? This court should reject Mr. Smith's request for certiorari for access to you guys for the simple reason that he lacks the authority to ask for it. What's he even doing here? Who let him in the building? Nor does Jack Smith have authority to conduct the underlying prosecution. Oh my goodness. The entire ordeal needs to be thrown out? Says those actions can only be taken by persons who are properly appointed as federal officers to properly created federal offices. Neither Smith nor the position of special counsel under which he purportedly acts meets those criteria. And that's a serious problem for the rule of law here in America. Whatever one may think of Trump or the conduct here, you got to have an actual prosecutor. Now, how did this illegality start? How did these people squeeze this one by? They tell us the illegality addressed in this brief started back on November 18th. That's when Merrick Garland, the current attorney general, who's doing a much worse job than I did. When he exceeded his statutory and constitutional authority and he allegedly purported to appoint Jack Smith to serve as the DOJ. He said that he was the special counsel. Now Smith was then appointed, quote, to do the following, to conduct the ongoing investigation into whether any person or entity, including Trump, violated the law in connection with the efforts to interfere with the lawful transfer of power during the January 6th event, okay? And he says, look, if you want to read that, easy, just go get it. You can see what happened, okay? Merrick Garland put in a writing, right? You know, I'm Eric Garland, and by order of this, I appoint Jack Smith special counsel. We read it here. Now he says, no counsel for any party authored in whole got any monetary contribution towards this. He said, okay, we're just filing this law professors and the former AG. He says, Attorney General Garland then, after that appointment, in that letter, he cited these four provisions of US code, 509, 510, 515, 533. He says, those are my authority. I get to use that law to appoint Jack Smith. But what Mies says, and these law professors, but none of those statutes, nor any other statutes, statutory or constitutional provisions even remotely authorized the appointment by the attorney general of a private citizen to receive extraordinary criminal law enforcement power under the title of special counsel. Like they just pulled Jack Smith from that pod over there in Klaus Schwab's International Criminal Court and they brought him over here. They just inserted the TDS chip, which was already there. They just elevated it. Let's pull that up to 11. Okay, now you're appointed. And they said, okay, well, here's why. First, the appointments clause of the constitution requires that all all federal offices that are not otherwise, quote, provided for, catch-all exception, that are in the Constitution, all federal appointments must, quote, be established by law. That's in the Constitution. And there is no statute establishing the office of the special counsel in the DOJ. That statutory provision relied upon by the DOJ and lower courts for the appointment of special counsels over the past half century do not authorize the creation and the appointment of special counsels at the level of U.S. attorneys. Okay, so he's saying basically 50 years
drafters of this law is bad. The provisions that the DOJ is relying upon to create these offices doesn't allow him to do that. And by the way, Nixon does not hold to the contrary because no question was ever raised in that case about the validity of the independent counsel's appointment. Okay, so basically, like the DOJ has just been creating these things and everybody's just been allowing them to happen for years, but nobody's ever actually done the analysis. So Merrick Garland just got the template out of the DOJ file and said, ah, oh, we'll just use 509, 510, 515, 533, but none of that gives him the authority to actually do it. Now, that case concerned the relationship between the president and the DOJ as an institution, not between the president and any specific actor purportedly appointed by the DOJ. So Jack Smith's case is a little bit different. And so in other words, Nixon doesn't like waive this, okay? Like the Supreme Court didn't impliedly authorize this by just accepting it. He says it wasn't even an issue in that case. Now, second, even if one overlooks the absence of statutory authority for that position, there is no statute specifically authorizing the attorney general rather than the president by and with the advice of consent of the Senate to appoint a special counsel. There's no law under the appointments clause, which is the constitution, inferior offices. And so if there is no law, you have to revert back to the constitution. Unless Congress said that the DOJ can do this, you can't because under appointments clause, which is now the governing law, they say inferior officers can be appointed. So somebody like Jack Smith can be appointed by department heads only if Congress says they can by statute. And you can go to the constitution to look at that. And it directs specifically enough to overcome a clear statement in presumption in favor of a presidential appointment and senatorial confirmation. So the appointments clause says that, and so direct specifically enough to overcome a presumption, right? The constitution wants presidential appointments and senatorial confirmation, but the DOJ just said, well, well, we can just kind of appoint our own special counsels that are not the attorney general, right? He says, but no such statute exists for the special counsel. And third, the special counsel, if he was considered a valid officer, is a superior or a principal rather than an inferior officer since he's at the top of the list. And thus he cannot be appointed by any means other than presidential appointment and senatorial confirmation, regardless of what any of the other statutes purport to say. The special counsel is not an inferior officer. He's head, so-called, of kind of a separate entity. Now this is true as a matter of not only the original meeting, but it's even true as a matter of law once understands that neither of those cases can plausibly be read to say that any person who is in any fashion subordinate to another executive official other than the president is an inferior officer. Such a reading of those decisions would lead to a ludicrous result that there is only one non-inferior officer in every executive department. So they say, to be sure, there are times when the appointment of a special counsel is appropriate. Okay, so we can do this, but the statutes and the constitution provides the means for those appointments by allowing the use of existing U.S. attorneys. Any number of U.S. attorneys have performed with distinction the function of serving as special counsel. Okay, so for example, on December 30th, this guy, Patrick Fitzgerald, he was the U.S. attorney for Illinois. He was lawfully appointed by the attorney general. That guy investigated the Valerie Plame leak affair under Bush Cheney, which arose within the jurisdiction of the district court. Fitzgerald, who was a Senate confirmed officer of the United States, then prosecuted and secured the conviction of Dick Cheney's chief of staff called Scooter Libby. That was in the U.S. District Court for Columbia. So you see what happened? They went out and they picked out an already existing U.S. attorney who's already in the government, right? Already, you know, appointed and approved by kind of the structure there. Another example involved another Senate confirmed U.S. attorney. You remember the name Rod Rosenstein, John Huber, John Durham, all Senate appointed special counsels. Now, all of these investigations and prosecutions of high level wrongdoing were lawful. So yeah, special counsels are great. We can do those. That's fine. No problem at all. But you got to pick a U.S. attorney. You can't just pick some citizen from overseas. Now, what federal statutes and the Constitution do not allow, however, is for the Attorney General Merrick Garland to appoint a private citizen called Jack Smith, who has never been confirmed by the Senate as a substitute U.S. attorney under the title special counsel, right? They just want to go find somebody. Yeah, this guy's a deranged thug. You'll, he'll fit the bill. Come on in, Jack. Oh, your wife loves Obama? Great. Love her too. Now that is what happened on November 18th. Merrick Garland went and got him. That appointment was unlawful, as are all the legal actions that have flowed from it, including Citizen Smith's. Oh, 
current attempt to obtain a ruling from this court. He has no power here because he is not a U.S. attorney lawfully authorized under the law. Saying, given their interest in the rule of law, the legal issue addressed in this brief is of particular importance to Amiki. The Honorable Edwin Meese, three, served as the 75th Attorney General, did a much better job under Ronald Reagan. Shout out to Meese. And he says, we, throughout our history, he's also a distinguished fellow emeritus at the Heritage Foundation, and his tenure as Attorney General throughout all of this time, he defended proper limits on the federal government. And these law professors are doing the same thing. Shout out to professors Calabresi and Lawson. Shout out. They're scholars of the original meaning of the Constitution, which we appreciate, and saying members of this court have cited their work in the past. And you can take a look. Gorsuch cited Lawson. All right. Thanks for that. Justice Thomas cited Calabresi. Thanks for that. That's fun legal drafting right there. Oh, you guys know who these law professors are, don't you? You do, Thomas, because you cited Calabresi and Gorsuch, you cited Lawson. So you know who they are. So they say, all right, with that backdrop here, these are the reasons for denying the petition, Supreme Court. First of all, no statute authorizes the position of special counsel that Jack Smith is seated in. He's got a stolen chair. In our constitutional system, Congress alone has the authority to create federal offices, not already established by the Constitution. And the Attorney General cannot ex nihilo fashion offices as he sees fit. Just create his own special counsel because Merrick Garland hates Trump. Nor has Congress given the Attorney General power to appoint a special counsel of this nature. And so, thus, without a legal office, Smith cannot wield the authority of the United States. He doesn't have an office, including his present attempt to try to seek relief in the Supreme Court. Who is this guy? Only Congress can create a federal office, not Merrick Garland. The Constitution itself creates no executive positions other than the presidency and the vice presidency if one considers that an executive position. Instead, the Constitution commits the power to create the federal offices to Congress under the Necessary and Proper Clause. It says Congress has the power to make, quote, all laws which shall be necessary and proper for the carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government or any other department thereof. Okay, so Congress gets to do that. But they didn't appoint Jack Smith. Garland did. A law creating offices to carry out the executive function is the quintessential law of Congress. And that means that Congress has the exclusive constitutional power to create that office. So what is Jack Smith doing? So here they tell us, Kagan was even deciding about dissenting in that opinion. But they say, if you go through that analysis, the Constitution does not give the president or the heads of the executive departments the power to create any offices or to appoint any officers that they deem appropriate. No. Instead, it requires that Congress first create all offices to which federal officers, superior and inferior, can be appointed. Okay? They usurped Congress. Now, they say this is confirmed by the Appointments Clause. You can read this in the Constitution. They tell us it provides that the appointment of officers, which, quote, which shall be established by law, capital, law, Article 2, saying that the addition of the emphasized phrase in the appointment Appointments Clause was deliberate. How do we know that? Well, on September 15, 1787, after, quote, officers of the U.S. whose appointments are not otherwise provided for were added the words and which shall be established by law. Okay, so these two law professors, they wrote a law review article. It's called The Records of the Federal Convention, 1787. Probably an awesome read, if I had to guess. But it says that they were chronicling this, like they were chronicling the Federal Constitutional Convention. What were they doing when they were drafting this Constitution? Well, on September 15th, after after they inserted that phrase, they also inserted this phrase, which shall be established by law. Okay, so Congress has to do it. Now, this addition's plain import is that the word law establishes that the office must be a statute. You don't just have somebody who just says, oh, we're gonna have 35 offices now because I got elected. No, we want some limitations on that, some limiting principles. A regulation or executive or judicial order is not the kind of law that can create an office under the appointments clause. So there's no, you know, executive or Order that just goes and appoints this. It's not Merrick Garland just deciding so. You need a law. Now, indeed, they say, the Constitution consistently uses the term law and laws, and when otherwise unqualified, we know that that means statutes, which come from Congress. So if no statute establishes an office, if Congress doesn't establish it, there is no office to which someone can be appointed. Now, the organic statutes of the Department of Justice that they just created do not, by law, vest in their powers the ability 
ability to appoint someone like this. The DOJ's current structure, which is provided by the law, by statute, includes the following. If you read the rules, it says they get, at the DOJ, you get one AG. You get one debt, which is Merrick Garland. You get one deputy AG, which is Lisa Monaco. You also get an associate AG. You get solicitor generals. You get 11 assistant attorney generals. You get one U.S. attorney for each judicial district, which is currently 94. So the U.S. attorney for the state. And then you have, you know, all of the other U.S. attorneys who work there. You get a director of the FBI. You get a director of the marshals. You get one U.S. marshal for each judicial district. You get a director of ATF. You get a director of the Bureau of Prisons. You get 21 U.S. trustees and as many United States attorneys and, quote, special attorneys as the attorney general deems necessary. Okay, that's it. That's the list. Now, this list does not include more than 100,000 people, ugh, gross, who work in the DOJ. The vast majority of federal workers, including those who work at the DOJ, are not, quote, officers of the United States. They're employees. Appointments are not controlled by the appointments clause and who therefore do not require any specific statutory authorization. For their appointments, it suffices to provide, as Congress has done, that, quote, each executive agency, so Congress wrote this into a statute, they said that each executive agency, military department, and government of the District of Columbia may employ such number of employees in the statute of the various classes recognized under the law. But officer positions must specifically be established by law, and employees cannot exercise the powers of officers. To be clear about this, and to be sure, they also tell us that the Ethics in Government Act, which was passed in 1978, they added to the mix what they called an independent council, right? So they wrote this into the rule. That was appointed, an independent council would be appointed by a special three-judge court upon a referral by the Attorney General. That didn't happen here in Jack Smith's case, not at all. So he was not an independent counsel, okay? And so you've seen this come up here on this channel when somebody else will come up and say, like Caitlin Collins from CNN will say, you know, he's independent, he's non-biased because he's appointed as a special counsel. Obviously, that's not true. He's not an independent counsel, which is what she was thinking, you know, when she said that. And I think it was Trump's former lawyer who kind of corrected her on that and said, no, there was no independent counsel, Caitlin. You are thinking about this wrong. Jack Smith is a partisan hack appointed by a partisan hack. Congress didn't approve him. Nobody gave it to an independent group of judges who said Jack Smith's great for this. He wasn't working for the Department of Justice previously. They just went and picked him up. But the statutory provisions for the independent counsel expired back in 1999 and Congress didn't reauthorize them. But shortly before that expiration, then Attorney General Janet Reno promulgated regulations which, if valid, are still in force today. And so Janet Reno said that there was an office of the special counsel. She just created it. She just created regulations, okay? She created the Code of Federal Regulations and she just made this up, Office of the Special Counsel. But that's not what the law says. You already told us what you can have. There is no Office of the Special Counsel here. They do get some special attorneys, whatever that is, let's see. So here, under these regulations, Janet Reno, the Attorney General, in some circumstances could appoint what they said, appoint an outside special counsel to assume responsibility for the matter, right? And she wrote that into the Code of Federal Regulations. Now, the regulations clarify that outside counsel means someone from outside the United States government. Huh, well, that's weird because I thought we had the appointments clause. Weird. Now, the Reno regulations, like the independent counsel statute, they contemplate an appointment specifically. They say the word appoint, okay? Not employ, appoint. And they use as a putative inferior officer, right? That's who that person is, of a non-governmental official to an office that is fully the equivalent of a U.S. attorney. So you just get to appoint whoever? Outside lawyer? But regulations are not the kind of law that can establish a federal office, okay? These CFRs, these Code of Federal Regulations, that's not Congress. That's the Justice Department passing regulations that, so Congress passes the statutes, the U.S. Code, and then they create regulations about how to interpret the code, and the departments are involved in the creation of those regulations. So, in other words, this is all usurping Congress. This is all being done in regulation, not by congressional statute. Only a statute can do that under the Appointments Clause, and no statute creates a special counsel with the jurisdiction and the authority that Jack Smith currently wields. Incredible. Now, the Reno regulations, they cite their authority. They say, oh, no, we can do this, because Janet said that 5 U.S. Code 301 and 509, 510, 515 to 519 give us the right to do this. So what happens is, okay, Congress is filled with morons, as we know. So Congress passes laws that they think are great. They write all these things into the rules, and they go, this is perfect. Then the attorneys get their hands on them. They're like, you guys are morons, okay? So then, you know, the agency 
frequencies come together and they cobble all of these together. So they'll say, okay, 509 plus 510 plus 515 plus 533. Individually, like none of those give me the authority to specifically go out and appoint a special counsel. But if I read them together, the totality of them, they give us the right to do that. And so then Reno assembles the regulations. They go into effect. Nobody challenges them for until we get here for whatever reason. Now, and it might be because Durham was appointed. Okay. And who are the other special counsels? Was Mueller appointed by Congress, right? All of the other ones appointed by Congress. These statutes singularly or collectively plainly provide that there is no authority for this so-called special counsel involving Jack Smith. So start with 5 U.S. Code 301, they say. This provision is a general authorization for the issuance of regulations by the AG. Here's what this says. Does this rule give them authority to appoint Jack Smith? They say the head of an executive department like Merrick Garland or a military department may prescribe regulations, okay, that the government and his department for the conduct, for the use and the preservation of its records, for the performance of its business and all of those other things, right? It gives you regulation authority. So maybe Garland can say, well, part of my regulation is to appoint a special counsel. But they say, look, this is not merely a general housekeeping provision. Nothing in it creates any offices or authorizes any creation or abolition of any offices. Indeed, if 301 were taken as a general authorization for appointment of officers, the entirety of the more numerous specific provisions for appointment of officers would be superfluous. And that's absurd. Okay, no one seriously advances it. So this is a very broad provision, but it's not broad enough to say that this section here, performance of business, I'm like, well, I need a special counsel for performance of business. Like, no, that's not what we're talking about here. There are other sections of the law for which that applies. So then they want to go over to 509. They say, well, let's look at 509. 509 says that all functions of other officers of the DOJ and all functions of the agencies and employees of the DOJ are vested in the AG, except for some functions that they're going to say not relevant here. But this provision also does not authorize the creation of any office. It simply says that the AG can control his subordinates. That's all. And he can personally assume and exercise their responsibilities. So it's defining the hierarchy. That's it. But it's not saying he can go out and start another hierarchy. Similarly, Section 510 says that the Attorney General may from time to time make such provisions as he considers appropriate, authorizing the performance by any other officer, employee, or agency of the DOJ. And so Jack Smith will say, oh, well, 510 says that I can just go appoint, you know, any other officer that I want. But he says, no, that's not true here. The statute provides for a shifting authority among persons who work at the DOJ, but it says nothing about who those persons are or how they got there. So in other words, it's a delegation power. Garland can delegate his responsibilities, authorizing other people to do things, but not authorizing a special counsel called Jack Smith, who's not an appointed official from outside the U.S. government to come in and do all these things. Now, they also cite 515 and the Reno regulations cite 515 to 519. Now, again, either alone or singly, none of these provisions comes even close to authorizing the creation of the special counsel or the appointment by Attorney General Garland of a private citizen to this position. First, here's what Section 515A says. It says you're only limited to the following power, telling us that the Attorney General or any other officer of the department or any attorney specially appointed by the Attorney General under the law, which again would be statutes, may, when specifically directed by the AG, conduct any kind of legal proceeding, civil or criminal, including grand jury proceedings and other things, which are authorized by law to conduct, and whether or not they're a resident of the district. They say that's a pretty easy one. Thus, 515 does not, it's specifically in there as clear as day, does not create any offices or authorize their creation. Instead, it concerns the powers of people who have already been properly appointed to offices under the law, which would be under congressional statute, pursuant to other statutory provisions, and it allows the attorney general to designate a U.S. attorney or another special attorney also appointed under the law to prosecute a case whether or not he's a resident of the district in which the proceeding is brought. And they go on. Section 515A is thus geographical and it's jurisdictional allocative provision. It's not a grant of power to go and appoint private citizens as Jack Smith's. For example, they say in 2003, this is how this worked. This clause allowed the attorney general in 2003 to appoint Patrick Fitzgerald, the Senate confirmed U.S. attorney confirmed by the Senate from the Northern District of Illinois to take on special counsel duties to go investigate Valerie Plame because he was already appointed and confirmed. That arose in the D.C. Now, this is geographical flexibility. So he came from Illinois and he went over to D.C. And so that's what 515 allows. It says each attorney can then, you know, and go into other locations. But that is not a grant of new power. It's not something 
saying that he can hire new officers. No, he instead provides its face that attorneys who have already been hired. Okay, you've already got to have been hired because you're already appointed and you can move them over different locations. And they may only be employees, not officers, and they can have a title and a salary. And so to be sure, they say we've got these two other provisions as well. We've got section 515A, 515B. Both of these provisions assumed that there are going to be attorneys specifically appointed by the attorney general under the law. They say here, right, specifically appointed under the law and specifically retained under the authority of the DOJ. But indeed, an explicit provision elsewhere, 543 below, authorizes the attorney general to hire persons who can then be nominated and commissioned as special assistants or special attorneys. But these provisions confer no authority to create offices like the office of the special counsel. The whole thing's illegal. And so likewise, these other sections 16 and 19, they concern internal allocation of authority among existing DOJ personnel, but they also provide no authority to create offices. 519 says, for example, Merrick Garland can supervise all litigation to which they're a party, and it can direct all U.S. attorneys who are already confirmed and assistant attorneys and special attorneys to discharge their respective duties. But there is no office creating power here either. Now, Section 519, however, it does point to the correct answer regarding the statutory authority to appoint special counsels. Section 519 notes that there are, quote, special attorneys appointed under 543 of this title. And they say, yeah, there are. Like, there are. You can do this. But Section 543 of Title 28 is explicit authority for the Attorney General to appoint special counsels. Like, in other words, 543 is the thing that matters. But they're not citing that, okay? Merrick Garland and others are not citing that one. Yet neither the Reno regulations nor the Garland memo appointing Jack Smith make any mention of this provision. Why not? Because it would be bad for them. Because Section 543 does not authorize the kind of special counsel contemplated by the Reno regulations or the Garland appointment. No, it's very narrow, as one would expect from the structure of this rule. The government for decades has steadfastly refused to rely on this provision that explicitly provides them with hiring authority, and it continues to refuse to rely on it in its current litigation for obvious reasons, that the provision contains internal limitations which the government seeks to avoid. So they write in that they've got authority from a bunch of provisions that don't actually give them the authority, and what they should be referencing is this. Let's see what they're actually allowed to do. The Attorney General may appoint attorneys to assist the U.S. attorneys, okay, so that's not Jack Smith, like he's the top dog, when the public interest so requires, including the appointment of qualified tribal prosecutors, which you'll find on Native American lands because they have their own legal systems throughout the United States, and other qualified attorneys to assist in the prosecution of federal offenses committed in Indian country. Okay, so, I mean, maybe they would indict Trump on, you know, Indian country and Indian land somewhere. Maybe that's another idea for him. But no, that's not what's happening here. This is in Washington, D.C., and this is in Florida. So that wouldn't apply to Jack Smith. Boy, you can see why they didn't really want to rely on that provision because that's a big not going to happen. Now, each attorney appointed under this section is subject to removal by the AG. So this is an obvious and explicit authorization for the creation and the appointment of special assistants or special counsels who merely assist the U.S. attorneys when the public interest so requires, not bringing in some unknown person who's not even in the DOJ until he was appointed a special counsel. There are, moreover, many contexts in which the appointment of these people makes sense. The government often encounters problems for which private lawyers lawyers have expertise, right? A U.S. attorney might not be an expert on, you know, technical aspects of spying, for example, although they're probably pretty good at it now since they've been doing it for years. But they might, might want to bring in another attorney to help them on a case. But he's not taking over the case. He's still working under and subordinate to the Senate-confirmed U.S. attorney in their office. So either gain from past or government service that might be useful. Crime, banking, antitrust, tribal law, and so on. All that makes sense. Those lawyers may not want a permanent government position, but may be willing to help the government on a limited basis, perhaps like on a task force or a team dealing with specific knowledge. But an appointment as a special assistant or a special counsel under the control of a U.S. attorney is an obvious win-win in many such cases, but not here. Now, the problem for the government in this case and in the case of the Reno regulations and the Smith appointment is that those regulations and the Smith appointment and order do not contemplate special counsels who assist U.S. attorneys. In other words, they're in violation of the section. Instead, they contemplate special counsels who literally replace the U.S. attorneys in specific cases. Smith, for example, 
was not appointed to assist U.S. attorneys. He was hired as a powerful standalone officer who replaces rather than assists the functions of other U.S. attorneys within the scope of his jurisdiction. This is precisely the role that the Ethics in Government Act authorized for independent counsels. That's why we have that. We don't anymore, but we did. But that statute no longer exists, and so they can't do that. And in the absence of that statute or a similar one, there is simply no statutory authority for the office of the special counsel. It is illegal, to which Smith could be appointed as a stand-in for a U.S. attorney. Was not confirmed by the Senate, is not a U.S. attorney. And so the remainder of Title 28 confirms this conclusion. Just read the law. Section 550-533, which is relied upon by Attorney General Garland, is part of a chapter dealing with the FBI. Okay, so he dug that one out. I have authority under 533, but that is about the FBI, not the DOJ. It's about investigative and other officials. Here's what that section says. It says the Attorney General may appoint, quote, officials to detect and prosecute crimes against the United States. They put officials there. To assist in the protection of the President, to assist in the protection of the AG, and to conduct other investigations regarding official matters under the control of the DOJ and the Department of State as directed by the Attorney General. So he can appoint officials, right? But 533-1 is not a general authorization to appoint officers. It specifically and solely authorizes the appointment of investigative and other officials. Officials, not officers, sounds pretty close, connected with the FBI. This does not include special counsels. It's FBI provision. This is clear for three reasons. One, when you look at the law, 533, when you look at where it is in the law, it's in chapter 33, and that deals with the FBI. Section 532, immediately before that, is entitled the Director of the FBI, and it spells out the Attorney General's authority over the FBI. Then 534 concerns preserving evidence in criminal cases. So just look at it in context, okay? It's FBI here on 532, 533, FBI, and then 534, FBI. But Merrick Garland is saying, wait, I'm going to use that for my office. So thus, 533 clearly deals with FBI officials and agents, not special counsels. And it makes sense in the context of this, right? Investigate and prosecute crimes, but also protect the president, protect the AG, and so on. So here they say, this is how the government has long understood this provision, which has been employed as the basis for the FBI's law enforcement authority. And second, 533 concerns the appointment of investigative and prosecutorial officials, not officers. Such officials, and that term as it's used in the statute, are not Article II officers of the United States, and they cannot perform the functions of officers of the United States. They are non-officer employees who, as FBI agents, must be subject to the supervision and the direction of officers of the United States. So the FBI, it needs office and field personnel to perform its functions, and that's why 533 allows the agency to have those officials. But those office and field personnel are not officers of the United States or do not have the range and the power of a special counsel. But to the contrary, they say, the word officer is a constitutional term of art, not only because it is used that way in the appointments clause, which governs this, but also because Article 2, Section 4 of the Constitution allows for the impeachment and the removal from office of all civil officers of the United States. We need a removal mechanism. Congress can try to impeach the Deputy Attorney General or the FBI Director, but no one thinks Congress can impeach the DOJ trial attorneys. No one thinks that the Office of Legal Counsel Attorney Advisors or field personnel at the FBI can be impeached. It's officers. Now, what is more, officers can be put by Congress in the line of succession to the presidency. They serve a role in our constitutional order. Look at the Constitution for that. But no one thinks that investigative officials at the FBI or DOJ trial attorneys who are bureaucrats, tell me about it, and employees can be put in line of succession to the presidency. That simply is not how the Constitution was using the term officials in Section 533. Now, they say an 18th century statute might have used a term like officials to have broader meaning than here. Even Judge Thomas is saying that. But as a matter of statutory interpretation, however, there is no plausible case for reading the term as it appears in 533 to be coextensive with the constitutional meaning of the term officer. You know, officer in America is very different than just a regular official. And they say third, and perhaps most tellingly, a cavalier reading of Section 533 to authorize hiring beyond its obvious FBI scope, it obliterates the structure of all of the title. That title is divided into chapters dealing with the Attorney General, the FBI, U.S. Attorneys, Marshals, U.S. Trustees, ATF, and others.
Brothers and the now sunsetted Independent Council, which is now dead. Wide-ranging special councils of the sort represented by Smith are not part of these provisions outside of the now defunct Ethics in Government Act sections. Continuing, saying at a more granular level, the effect of a loose reading of these statutes is even more bizarre. Congress, as noted earlier, has provided for the appointment, all with presidential nomination and senatorial consent, of an AG, an associate AG, solicitor general, 11 assistant AGs, and so on. And exactly one U.S. attorney for each judicial district, currently 94. Got to appoint each one of them. Now, a reading of 533 to essentially create unlimited inferior officer appointment power wreaks havoc on this structure. In other words, if Merrick Garland can just avoid all of that, I actually don't even need the Senate. I can just appoint my inferior officers however I want. It would allow the attorney general to appoint an entire shadow DOJ to replace the functions of every single statutorily specified officer. No wonder the Reno regulations did not invoke it. Okay, no wonder, in other words, they didn't even look at this because they knew that if they put it under that power, it would clearly be attacked. So the DOJ is, you know, as gross as you could ever imagine, right? They probably know this and have been squeezing this through until finally we see that it is illegal. Now, for the reasons described in depth in this court and in the case in Nixon, Nixon did not pass the scope, pass on the scope of the law. The decision contains some ill-considered dictum regarding 533, meaning it's not relevant to the actual holding, but it's bad dictum. It merits no weight. Anyone tempted to rely on Nixon as some sort of an endorsement of 533 should read the case briefs to see what the issues were truly raised there. Those issues involved only the relationship between the president and the DOJ as an institution. The same arguments would have been raised if the attorney general personally, rather than the independent counsel had brought the suit at issue there, but that didn't happen. Nixon was argued and decided before the modern rebirth of separation of powers, which dates back to 1976. So they say, don't think of Nixon as something that essentially codifies this. In short, writes Mr. Edwin Meese, the position supposedly held by Smith special counsel, illegal, was not established by law. The authority exercised by him as a so-called special counsel far exceeds the power exercisable by a mere employee, Jack. He is acting as an officer of America, but aside from the fact and the specific offenses, but aside from the specific offices listed in the statutes discussed above, there is no office that he can validly hold. That alone robs him of his authority to represent the United States in any capacity including before this court, telling us the appointments clause establishes a default rule. All heads of department and their principal officers are subject to Senate confirmation. Even if one somehow thinks that existing statutes authorize the appointment of some standalone special counsel with the full power of a U.S. attorney, Smith was not properly appointed to such an office. No statute clearly authorized his appointment by any mode other than presidential appointment and Senate confirmation. Any such statute, of course, is governed by the Appointments Clause. Look to Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution. That tells us that the President shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers, councils, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States whose appointments are not here enlisted, but which shall be established by law, by statute. But Congress may, by law, vest the appointment of other such inferior officers as they think proper in the President alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of the department. Okay, that's the appointments clause. Now, this sentence makes three things clear. First, the default mode of appointment for all officers, which they claim Jack Smith is, whether superior or inferior, is presidential nomination, Senate confirmation, and then presidential appointment, with Jack did not happen. Second, this default presumption can only be overridden by Congress in the case of inferior officers. And third, which didn't happen here, even in the case of inferior officers, Congress must speak clearly to authorize the permissible mode of appointment for those officers other than presidential nomination, Senate confirmation, and the presidential appointment. And so this latter clear statement rule is implicit in the appointments clause and the constitutional structure. That clause is both a separation of powers and a federalism provision. It divides appointment between the president and the Senate. That's done with good reason, not between the president and Congress as a whole, which lacks power to 
appoint and confirm appointees. The Senate is the body in which states receive equal representation. We all get two, whatever their size or population, which guards against large state presidents underrepresenting smaller states in the executive and the judicial departments. As one convention participant put it when they were writing this stuff, presidential appointment power without the check of the Senate would allow presidents to gain over the larger states by gratifying them with the preference of their citizens. And so these structural concerns warrant an interpretive presumption in favor that we need clear statements from Congress if they're going to allow other inferior officers to be appointed. Now, even if you don't find this presumption, simple ordinary statutory interpretation demonstrates that the attorney general received no power to appoint special counsels as inferior officers. None of the statutes canvassed in this motion, in this brief, show any authorization. In fact, the opposite. In contrast, the DOJ's organic statute, the organic statutes of agriculture, education, health, and other things, they do contain inferior appointment. Look at this. If you look at other domains, let's step outside from the DOJ. Let's walk next door to agriculture. Let's go see what's up at education. Let's see what's happening with health and human services and the CDC. Let's say what's up with transportation and Pete Buttigieg on paternity leave. All of those other agencies, they do contain inferior officer appointment power clauses. Congress put them in. Thus, the agricultural secretary, according to their rules, may appoint such officers and employees, according to Congress. Education is authorized to appoint such officers and employees. Health and Human Services is, quote, authorized to appoint officers and employees under 42 U.S. Code. 49 U.S. Code. Transportation. They can appoint officers. And Congress gave the AG the power to appoint additional officers and employees as he deems necessary, but only specifically for the Bureau of Prisons, okay? So if you go over to 4041 of Title 18, he can appoint officers, but only for the Bureau of Prisons, okay? Limited, not for the DOJ. No, it's unclear, they say, why Congress chose to give general inferior officer appointment power to the other secretaries, but not to the AG. Don't know why they did that. It may be because of the unique threat that an unwise attorney general could pose to civil liberties, like if they prosecute their political opponents. They might be able to wreck the separation of powers. They may be able to wreck federalism. But this court does not need to divine Congress's reasons for making different policy choices because the relevant statutes are unambiguous. Don't need to read their minds because you just need to read the law. Now, even if Jack Smith was statutorily authorized, they would be a superior officers who would need presidential appointment and Senate confirmation. So saying, look, Supreme Court, if you find that the statutes do grant him some right to be here, if he actually had the power to convene grand juries and issue subpoenas and direct and conduct prosecutions and file appeals, if he could do all of those things, then he would obviously be an officer of the United States, okay? He would not be a mere employee if he could do that. But more than that, he would be a superior officer, okay? Or a principal officer because that's what these people are. It says, and by plain terms of the appointments clause, superior officers must be appointed by the president and they must have the advice and consent of the Senate. That is not how Jack Smith was appointed. And he thus could not serve as special counsel, even if such a position validly existed. So two things here. Okay. One, he's saying the special counsel's office is invalid, right? There is no other office for Jack Smith to be in. Even if you find the office is valid, Jack Smith as a man is not allowed because he was not appropriately appointed. So it's a blowout in both arguments. Now the special counsels contemplated by the Reno regulations are the equivalent of, if not more powerful than U.S. attorneys. It is obvious that as an original matter that U.S. attorneys are superior offices and the same is true of special counsels who mirror them. And so the only plausible argument to the contrary rests not on the original meaning, but of some other court decisions that were wildly overread. Those decisions contain language that you may be able to extract, but federal courts should hold against them because could Congress therefore let the attorney general appoint the court of the appeals judges? Could Congress, in other words, could delegate all their appointment power to the AG? No, of course not. That doesn't make any sense. So saying one can be a superior rather than an inferior officer in two ways. One is to have no decisional superior other than the president, which is kind of what Jack has. The other is to have so much power and authority that one is superior in a substantive sense. And both of those Jack Smith is. Now, as Justice Souter perceptively wrote in another case, he says the terms are confusing. But in this case, either way, if Smith is an officer, he is a superior officer. He has no supervising person. No one's directing him. Attorney General Garland does not supervise or direct him, so he says. And as he said, he would not, when Smith was appointed, 
appointed special counsel. And so, sounds like he's superior, according to even Merrick Garland's own conclusion. And so, Smith has, without the participation of the Solicitor General, filed a petition to this Supreme Court on behalf of the United States. He can't do that. Only the Solicitor General can. He's prosecuting a former president the first time that that's happened in our nation's history. Smith is purporting to exercise at least as much power as a U.S. attorney, and arguably more. This is the hallmark of a superior officer, who must be appointed as such. And so, the absence of such an appointment means that Smith lacks the authority to even entertain Sir Rory at the Supreme Court. And that is a powerful, sufficient reason to deny his petition. Saying, in conclusion, Supreme Court not clothed in the authority of the federal government. Smith is a modern example of a naked emperor. Improperly appointed, he has no more authority to represent the United States in this court than Bryce Harper, Taylor Swift, or Jeff Bezos. That fact is sufficient to sink Smith's petition, and the court should deny review. We express no views on the merits issues addressed in Smith's unauthorized petition. Respectfully submitted by Gene C. Scher, Justin Miller, Aaron C. Ward. Outstanding brief as counsel for the Amici Curie, who are, as we know, Edwin Meese, former Reagan AG, law professor Stephen Calabresi, and Gary S. Lawson, doing amazingly incredible legal work here, exposing and spotlighting for all of us to see that Jack Smith is an illegally appointed so-called special counsel, not even properly vetted, appointed by Joe Biden, confirmed by the Senate, not a U.S. attorney, completely outside of the law. Illegitimate, the whole thing. And this is exactly what we would expect from these people because they did the same thing with the January 6th Select Committee. Remember, they passed H.R. 503, said we create this committee, and they illegally constituted that. It was made up of the wrong people, and they conducted it anyways. So all of this is now being exposed and I am very hopeful that the Supreme Court will take this to heart and invalidate this entire area of law because that is one way to handle this whole thing. They don't need to make immunity decisions. They don't need to get into double jeopardy. Jack Smith is just done by virtue of statutory operations. Was he legally constituted? Sorry, Merrick Garland. And the whole thing could go away right then and there. Now, I think there are other very important issues the Supreme Court does need to address. I do want to hear about double jeopardy. I do want to hear about the insurrection clause, the 14th Amendment, and all of these other things, but this is fascinating, okay? From a technical perspective, Merrick Garland and the DOJ, they have been tap dancing on the pin of a head of a pin, man. They are just about to fall off on this thing everywhere you turn. He's not even legitimate. And this is an outstanding brief. Now, this is what we're going to hear in reaction to what is happening against Trump. This person is a Republican election lawyer, and he was on CNN, and they had this exchange where they're talking about what's happening, okay? Colorado is booting Trump off the the ballot. We've got four different criminal indictments. Jack Smith is illegitimate. We've got all sorts of issues popping up at the Supreme Court. And now CNN and Jen Psaki are freaked, man. They're like, what are we going to do about this if Jack Smith's not even legitimate? I mean, they're doing cartwheels around this guy. They're like a hagiography for Jack Smith. They love him because he is taking out their enemy. But the dude is not even legitimate. Here is some conversation about the status of Trump's cases. And listen to what happens when Caitlin Collins hears some of this news that the court is probably going to find in Trump's favor. Pending or potentially pending in front of the Supreme Court, each of which will drastically impact the election. We have this one, first of all. Which we which know, that's the whole will, point. I think, obviously determine whether Donald Trump's on the ballot in Colorado and potentially elsewhere. We are waiting on whether they will rule that Donald Trump is immune in his federal election challenge. And if he is, that case goes away. We're waiting to see if they take that. And at the same time, they've taken, the Supreme Court has taken a case which will essentially determine whether two of Jack Smith's four charges, the two obstruction charges, will stand against him. So all three of these cases either are in front of the Supreme Court or likely will soon be. They all will determine either directly whether he's on the ballot in certain states or indirectly whether he takes a major hit to his electoral fortunes. I mean, Ben, that's pretty remarkable what Ellie just laid out there. If you think about everything that is going to be before the Supreme Court, that could Lawfare determine onslaught. Donald Trump's fate, whether it's electorally or criminally. Yeah. Yes, and plus the country is much more divided now than it's ever been before. I mean, in a sense, if you're a Supreme Court justice, it makes Bush versus Gore look like a walk in the park. And of course, three of the Supreme Court justices were down in Florida litigating Bush versus Gore. But this is a moment where the Supreme Court, no matter what they do or if they don't do, is going to play a major role in the presidential campaign, which puts a real premium on them sticking with legal principles about when they do have to weigh in.
into these things. Well, Ben, then what did you make of Sean Grimsley, the attorney who was arguing in front of the Colorado Supreme Court, which has a very different makeup than the U.S. Supreme Court? He says that he doesn't think that it has anything to do with even politics for some critics of the Supreme Court who will think that. He thinks that they will prevail here. I mean, do you believe that that's likely at all? No, actually, I don't. I mean, I think the only people who have found that Donald Trump committed insurrection have been his political opponents. Bingo! And I think that's pretty dangerous for the country and not a real incentive for the U.S. Supreme Court to rule that way as well. I mean, the deference of Supreme Court cases is always been to let the voters decide. Right. And so making rulings, knocking somebody off is not what they've ever done before. Granted that an insurrection charge and everything that's gone on with Donald Trump is, as Ellie's pointed out, really unique in our history. Yeah, it's going to be, I think, a difficult thing to have the Supreme Court disenfranchise 1.3 million Coloradans. I'm not sure that they're going to do that. Despite what they might want to have happen, the likelihood that that happens, I think, is low. But maybe they just toss all the cases out based on presidential immunity. They could have double jeopardy for the J6 stuff. That would invalidate the Georgia case. That would invalidate the D.C. case. We would still have, if presidential immunity comes back, we would have, I think, exonerations. Well, maybe Florida would still move forward, but they are nervous about this. They're not liking the answers. Trump keeps going up in the polls and they're freaked here on MSNBC's new hit show called Inside Jen Psaki. These two guys are having a conversation with her and Jen is asking them, what can we do? Can we indict him again? Is there anything? A lot of Trump supporters are not going to leave his side and we're starting to lose and we're freaked. As you wrote in your piece, as we can see in the polls and examples, I just cited durable coalition. There's a durable coalition that seems to be kind of rolling with Trump and what he's saying, what all of this racist rhetoric, this language that many people say, this is not who we are, which you talk about in your piece. What can Democrats actually do about that? Help well, us. Well, first of all, they Help can us. accept it, that the durability of this is going to continue. I mean, That's there is right. There's a body of forgiveness. We're of not going anywhere. Celebration of this kind of rhetoric that now goes back seven to eight years. So, I mean, that is here for good. What I think was interesting about the intro that you just did was the, the quote from, I guess, the woman in Iowa. Mm. People call me a dictator. There is a glibness to this, Mm -hmm. but there is also a celebration of strength. And I think it was your former colleague, Dan Pfeiffer, who said in his message, he has a really good message substack thing, but he basically said, look, when he says dictator, uses words like that, his supporters do like it. They like that, that he's strong. strong. Yeah, that's right. We We like that he's going to balance the scales of justice. Okay, you guys have perverted it by becoming little dictatorial maniacs who are prosecuting him in many locations. And so when he says that we're going to even the scales, we're going to return this to norm. Yeah. You better believe we like that because we want justice and we don't want weaponized political prosecutions by hack prosecutors across America. And so if there are people who are involved in malicious prosecutions, if there's a bunch of people who created a conspiracy to get U.S. citizen indicted because they don't want to run against him, okay, that's not justice. That's not due process of law. So yeah, we are excited about him coming back and returning to form. These supporters have said for a long time, he's definitely dialed up the rhetoric, but he also contrasts it with what he perceives Joe Biden to be and what voters have perceived Joe Biden to be next to this dictator, a weaker leader, someone who is older, someone who is more reserved. So it's actually getting a lot done for him. And yes, we can sort of roll our eyes or actually get really alarmed at this at our peril. But ultimately, this is actually, there seems to be a method to this. There is a method to it. Yeah, because we're watching him respond to your corruption. Okay, it's not just like Trump is just waking up like, I'm just going to cause havoc in the country and just go after my enemies. No, it's you guys have perverted the entire sense of justice in America, and we're excited about a return to form. And so, Jack Smith, as we know, illegally appointed, not even validly constitutionally allowed to be bringing these prosecutions, and Edwin Meese and those law professors are outstanding heroes for calling this to our attention, and we'll see what the Supreme Court says about this, my friends. Now, we're going to be continuing to cover this one at length, and so I hope you join us at robertgovea.com if you want to get the red lines on the document and review the full PDF. It is over there. robertgovea.com. We have a nice new shop up there where you can grab a new hat that includes the Watcher logo on it. And the Watcher logo is Justitia. It's Libertas, the Roman goddesses combined into one. It's got the scales of justice. It's got the shield and the sword to cut through the bonds of ignorance. We are going to continue to cover this, my friends. So thank you for subscribing and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one.